somewhere there is a poem, and I want to write this poem, I want to speak this poem, I want to feel this poem, I want to experience this poem, cradle it in my arms, feed it a good meal, and send it on its merry way. I want to sing this poem. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Somewhere there is a poem screaming, get up, stand up, stand up for your rights, human beings, human beings, 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 so caught up in the tangible material surface that they never actually feel. Their touch is liquid and grazes right through, but misses the core. This poem speaks to me and rocks me to sleep and tells me stories of indigenous people diseased and tricked and slaughtered and made to be extinct. But this ain't no pterodactyl or tyrannosaurus rex blood running through my veins. I am a Creek American Indian. I exist. I am an African. I am an old Jewish woman muttering prayers in Yiddish as my name is replaced with a number on my arm. I am a little Japanese girl staring in horror as my village is bombed and burnt to the ground. I was born in India, but not to the right caste, so regardless of what I accomplish, I will always be a pe peasant. I died in Mexico, three feet from the border, gunned down by evil troops who shoot for a living and sacrifice their souls for the man-made boundaries of this America. Someday, there is a poem. Someday, flying high on the 405 or taking the L, L to Brooklyn, the 15 to Vegas, a martyr through Atlanta, and cruising down the dark street in Oakland is a poem. This poem comes from somewhere deep, somewhere where angels sleep, where pixies dance, and mermaids weep, where hymns are hung. So God will keep us all in mind on Judgment Day. This poem warns but does not sway, for what you do is up to you, where you go or who you know, if you close up or if you grow. Somewhere there is a poem yelling the t tales of war, Hiroshima, Hiroshima, war, war, hero, 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 heroine is, crack cocaine is, the systematic genocide of my people, brown skin behind bars, locked up behind bars, trapped behind bars, enslaved behind bars, kept in line behind bars, counting behind bars, bars, there are more bars. Selling more wine in a single reservation than all of Ventura, counting, 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 counting me in because I'm down for the revolution and it may not be televised and it may not get radio play, but it will be told through poetry because somewhere there is a poem. This poem speaks to me and draws me in like an amusement park to a kid. I'm going to love this poem. I want to dream this poem and share it with y'all. Hold up. I just did. Thank you. <laughs>
we'll see, right? Identity is a constant negotiation between both how you see yourself, right? What you are, who you are, things that make you up, uh, and how others see you, how you're influenced by particular social structures. So what does it mean, right, to have an identity? What do you think it means to have an identity? That means, like, the, the, the ownership and stuff, someone else assigned your identity, to have an identity, it's not necessarily, like, to be assigned. So, having an identity, you can just think of someone just blankly labeling you as just one thing, unchangingly. Okay. Something you can claim that is personal to you. Something that you can claim that is personal to you. Something that you're able to, like, shape and change. Something you're able to shape and change. Okay? Uh, are identities influenced, what are identities influenced by? Right? So I hear a lot of, we determine our own identity, right? We get to claim our own ownership over our identity, but, yeah. Our identities are uh, influenced by stereotypes and culture. Okay? It's influenced by stereotypes and culture, right? It's influenced by the way in which structures are in place. Like what society dictates. Right. What society dictates, right? So your identity is always in those constant is always in that constant fluctuation, right? It's determined by different factors, right? So it's not just the ability to have ownership over something or have ownership over who you are, right? But to understand that that particular, uh, your particular body, right, is situated into the society, right? So we use this phrase then, identity politics. What do you think, so we've defined identity, what is politics? Uh, someone that hasn't spoke to me. Shreya, what is politics? It's like, it's more to happen like between people talking about issues, I guess, in the world. Okay, it happens between people, but what do you mean, like, when you say, right, like, something is political, what does that mean? <coughs> I guess there's a certain amount of controversy, like, being the best Yeah, there's controversy around it, right? To be political, right? What do, what do we mean, like, so, you know, we elect people, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Go, things go, laws get passed, right, in politics, right? What is that, what is the implication of that? You conversate about structures within the society that you live in. Okay, yeah, it's a negotiation between the society. So, what does it mean, then, when we say identity politics? A negotiation of how our identity is within society. Yes. Identity politics is the politicization of our identity, right? How our identity is structured within society, how we are influenced. So I'm going to start with giving a little bit of a brief background as to how identity politics comes to exist, and both identity politics and intersectionality. And then they're going to talk about specific ways in which we uh, kind of influence this within the debate space and kind of how that works. So identity politics as a term has come to represent a wide range of political activity uh, and theorizing founded in the shared experience of injustice of members of certain groups in society. What do you think that phrase means? Comes to represent a political shared experience around marginalized groups of society. So between all marginalized groups, there are certain structures that oppress them and therefore there is an interconnectedness within their oppression. Okay, what do groups uh, unite around? Do they unite around political ideologies? Unite around suffering. Okay, maybe suffering, right? What else do they might unite around? A common culture. Okay, yes, a common culture, right? A shared group identity. Do you think beliefs might be something that people would unite around? Would that create a form of identity politics? So groups oftentimes do not organize around social beliefs, around political ideas or strategies, but instead around a marginalized group identity, right? Something that makes you different in society. So McPhail writes this article, and I'll send you, I'll send your lab leaders the kind of bibliography of the authors I re reference. Uh, McPhail writes this article, he says that people are categorized into groups based on particular attributes or social identities. Group identity is viewed as both the source of oppression and a potential site of liberation. These group identities are used as categories of analysis for theorizing, conducting research, and planning political action, as well as informing social work practice, policy, and education. Right? So what McPhail is saying 
is that people unite around particular shared identities, right? Who they are, what that means, and from that shared group identity, formulate into political action, formulate into political thought, formulate into kind of radical ideas, etc. Right? So, and inform every aspect of society. So let's fast forward a little bit. How many's ever heard the term intersectionality? Somebody tell me what it means that hasn't spoken to me all the way in the back. Uh, like an intersection between two marginalized or multiple marginalized groups. Like if you exist at a cross of, crossing of like paths um, and your experience is like always influenced by all of those, uh, like but the fact that you were a part of all those marginalized groups. Okay. Sure. That is one Definition, yes. Yeah. Intersectionality would, for example, say there is a unique oppression for the black woman because she's not only women, but she's also black. Okay. Those are two different types of that would pose in, that poses a question, which is what makes up our identity? What are some things that make up our identity? Give me one. Class. Class. Okay. Can we write this? Class. Race. Race. Gender. Gender. Sexuality. Sexuality. What else? Affinity. Huh? Okay, affinity, religion, anything else? Skin color. Skin color. So we got race. Anything else? Okay, yeah, I think this is a pretty decent list, right? I'm, there are other things that make up kind of these prescribed identities, right? So intersectionality, this term uh, coined by Kimberly William Crenshaw. If you haven't read, you should read. Uh, Crenshaw coined this term in 1989. She's an American critical legal race scholar. And she basically says that we have these multiple forms of identities, right? These things that intersect with one another. So the example that Amit gives, right, is that, uh, is that intersection between being both black and woman, right? So you are not just black or you are not just a woman, right? But you are a black woman, right? And those intersections meet together to create a unique form of an identity that oftentimes gets excluded from the traditional discourse around race, around gender, etc. Right? So things like QUAR studies, which uh, is offered later on this week, for example, says that there is uh, intersections around the basis of race, class, gender, and sexuality, right? So someone who is black and queer is not just black and queer, but they are black queer, right? And so those intersections are always in conflict with, them, with one another, right? So intersectionality comes to exist by Crenshaw, right, and other kind of these critical legal scholars uh, for because traditional race studies uh, did not account for it, right, traditional class studies did not account for those overlaps, traditional gender studies, uh, feminism uh, primarily, which is where Crenshaw actually starts a lot of her criticism, does not account for the complexity of those identities. So I'm going to read a, I'm going to read a quote, and I want you to tell me what you think of this. We are always race, gendered, sex oriented, and so on. Whites have a race, men have a gender, straights have a sexual orientation, and middle class status is a class identity. What do you think of that? Is that true? Yeah. Do we often think of white people as having a race? Why? Okay, so we never talk about it in discussion. Yeah. Um, it's like majoritarian, like the default white, the default the black, the Okay, so we make assumptions, right, that white folks just don't have a race because they're the majority. Yeah. It creates, it, it's a norm that, like, anybody else is differentiated from, right? So, like, it's considered to be normal to be white and anything else. Yeah, 
slightly normalized identity? Okay, yeah, so white people do have a race, but yes. Well, like, I think the reason we don't, like, like normally think about it is because, like, power. No. Like, it's just, like, what you're yeah. supposed to be. And anything else, like, a deviation. Yes. We normalize identity based on particular power structures that are in place. Yeah, what were you going to say? But I would also think that um, one reason why is it's, like, I, I know what you're saying that we normalize it, but, and that, that is true. But I kind of like to think that they also just think of white people as people as opposed to, like, other races. Other races are constantly ah. on the basis of race, right? The same thing with men, right? We assume, right, in regards to gender, right, men don't have a gender, right? Gender is something that's uh, exclusively left, left to women or trans populations, right? The same thing with sexuality, right? We tend to assume that straight people don't have a sexual orientation, right? So the popular phrase, right, you chose to be gay, right? The flip side of that, we don't ever say you chose to be straight. So we normalize these particular identities in society. So uh, to continue, the quote says, what tends to hide these particular identities from careful inspection is the fact that each is defined as the norm in the US. Consequently, those who are the norm are often unaware they are privileged. And for those of you that want to know, that's Frank Cooper uh, in an essay-ish titled Against Bipolar Black Masculinity, Intersectionality, Assimilation, Identity, Performance, and Hierarchy. Again, I'll send this to the Bible here. So what does that mean? What are the implications of that? I think that means that when you're the norm in society, when you're sort of the default race within your community, you often forget that you're privileged. Yeah, you often forget you are privileged, and the consequences of that are what? If you forget that you're privileged, you don't realize the oppression that you're perpetuating. Yeah, you don't recognize the oppression you perpetuate. What else were you going to say? no motivation to try to help or like stop that oppression, right? Like if you don't realize it's there. Yeah, it's like you have no reason to take action, right? Why? Because you are the beneficiary, right, of that particular action, right? If you take action, then you only hurt yourself, right? And that's how privilege works. I don't know if anybody wants to enter a privilege lecture, but. Um, so why do we talk about then, why is it important that we talk about both identity politics and things like intersectionality? Why do you think we talk about them? We've already said kind of a framing that says, right, if we don't, right, that those who are often the norm don't think about their privilege, don't ever have to reflect on that privilege yet. I think it's because if you're one of the, like, if your identity is one of the norms in the society that you live in, we're having these conversations so that we don't forget that you are privileged, so that you don't really perpetuate your oppression on privilege. Okay. What were you going to say? Uh, something along the same lines. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We talk about identity, right? The reason why identity politics became so uh, prominent, right, and the reason why it became necessary was because those who were privileged in society, right, never have to reflect, right? So identity politics forces a conversation about the way in which that identity has then become politicized in society and what the implications of that means. So identity politics itself comes around uh, the emergence of political movements in the second half of the 20th century, right? So you've got things like second wave feminism, you've got things like civil rights, you've got things like gay liberation movements, right? That were all fighting for the way in which their identity was structured in society, say, hey, listen to me, right? Hey, you're doing some really messed up things, right? So these movements begin to take up discussion that serves as the basis kind of for the formulation of intersectionality. So identity, I always make the claim that identity is always politicized, right? We all have some form of an identity, right? We are all inherently bound by social structures. We're caught up in social structures. So we all have some form of identity. So when I say identity is always politicized, what does that mean? What do you think it means? We define identity politics at least right, at a very basic level. So what does it mean when I say identity is always politicized? What does that mean, that it's never neutral? Like, whenever there's identity involved in it, you can't just look at it as, like, complete equality or, like, colorblind or anything like that because there's power associated with identity and history associated with identity. Okay, right. So, yeah. I think it also means that we're always negotiating, scrutinizing, attempting to change for the better our, our identity, other, other people's identities in order to fit into an idea that we believe is correct. Yeah, we are always, our identity is always 
always in constant flux. It is always in constant negotiation, right? So how I perform my identity, what I uh, embrace as part of my identity, right, might change as I'm up here talking, right, to you all in the classroom versus what I might do uh, later on, right? Like, versus, like, sitting around playing a card game, right? Like, right now I'm instructing. Later on I might be sitting playing Monopoly. Probably not, because I don't have Monopoly. But, you know, uh, and I always lose. So, <laughs> and I'm trying not to be capital. All of this. Uh, so, uh, right? But our identity is always in that constant state of flux. And so it is about negotiating that. The other thing I will say is that identity politics is not about politics of recognition. How many have ever heard that phrase, politics of recognition? Anybody? One, what does that mean? Or two? What do you think of politics of recognition is? Well, I don't really know like, the exact definition, but it's assuming it's like just saying, like, just putting your label on someone. Okay? Yeah. So politics of recognition tend to ask for people to be recognized. Identity politics, at least in the in the literature, makes the claim that we demand uh, that demand uh, that recognition is demanded on the grounds for which it's been denied. Right? Along the basis of race, along the basis of class, gender, sexuality, etc. Right? So demand is not for the purpose of inclusion, right? But rather for respect for oneself, right? To force structural change. It does not say I want to be included into the system. I want the system to change. Does that make sense? It's the difference between the ask for inclusion, right? So it makes a structural analysis of so of well of social structures. Yeah. Wait, so it means you said it means that we want the system to change as opposed to the system to include us? Yes. Um is it the one that is that we want the system to change so that it can include us? No. What does it mean to make the distinction between a demand for inclusion or a request for inclusion? Isn't that like the society's plan that I really want to be a part of it? Yes. Whereas As it is, we want to be a part, right? So identity politics says no, that's not sufficient because laws were not written to include particular populations, right? Right? So if you just include somebody into the law, it does nothing to change the law itself that creates the process, right? So for example, right? We would say maybe on this particular topic, if we were talking about war on drugs, for example, right? We would say we want drug laws to change to not target black and brown folks, right? But laws were written in a way that targeted them, right? That creates a system of mass incarceration, et cetera, according to Alexander, right? So you would say you want the entire structure to change. It does not make individual demands for it to be included into the system, but to change the system altogether, right? So there are a couple of problems that people have with identity politics, and I'm just going to briefly cover these um, and then be done. The first is that people believe that it's totalizing, right? So uh, intersectionality challenges traditional conceptions of identity politics uh, because it says that uh, identity politics tries to formulate along these particular groups, right? On the basis of race, gender, sexuality, class and tries to categorize them out. Intersectionality, a term I introduced by Crenshaw, says that that's not sufficient because there are always those overlapping identities, right? So one of the claims about the problems with identity politics is that it attempts to homogenize folks, right, into categories that says you must choose between your queerness and your race, or your gender and your race, or your gender and your sexuality, or uh, your class and your sexuality, or whatever, right? All of those things. The second criticism that tends to exist for identity politics is that it overlooks experience, right? This is the distinction between having being both singly having singly subordinated identities versus multiple subordinate identities, right? That even if even if you are race, right? Like even if you share a common group struggle, right? That marginalization can happen within groups, right? The belief that you are just singly subordinated, right? The belief that you are, right, always just oppressed because of one of these categorizations, right? And that you cannot engage in forms of oppression yourself, right? Is a structural criticism that people make towards identity politics, that it overlooks those intersections, that it overlooks, right, the ability to be oppressive yourself, right? So studying racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, Disability overlooks the experience of those that have multiple identities, right? So you've got formulations of black feminism, black queer thought, right? Uh, 
uh, even black uh, ableism studies now uh, to some extent, uh, that talk about right, the way in which both identities, because they interact with one another, different than the intersectionality theory, uh, the distinction between singly versus multiple subordinate, right? Uh, that says that because identity politics attempts to overlook those particular identities, those particular multiple identities. The third thing that's a really common criticism, uh, may or may not be true, uh, is this idea that it creates a form of oppression of others. Right? Identity politics, because it categorizes things out, right, says one identity, uh, one marginalized group status comes before the other. Just giving you the kind of foundational four criticisms. And uh, there is a fourth one uh, that uh, some authors might uh, believe that intersectionality, identity politics themselves, right, are historically inaccurate and inaccurately traced. I'm sorry, they are inaccurately traced in the academy, right? That uh, the understandings of these forms of oppression, right, don't have proper tracing, that we don't do full historical analysis, that we don't do sufficient historical analysis. Uh, if you want uh, to kind of chat about that a little bit more, I won't go into too much depth, you might want to talk to uh, Dr. Curry, for example, who criticizes uh, some of the way in which intersectionality theories uh, in the academy have been kind of traced as being historically inaccurate, but just a thought. That said, uh, intersectional analysis then becomes a response to identity politics in a lot of capacity. Uh, and I'm going to explain this using Curtis Vaughn's uh, method of understanding intersectionality. Um, and so what they say is that there are four types of intersectional invisibility that we should trace. The first is a historical invisibility, right? The way in which marginalization of intersection uh, or intersectional experiences uh, happen on the basis of historical narratives, right? So we de-emphasize or we, we misrepresent uh, mainstream records. So example, uh, black queer studies says that uh, most of the race lit tends to kind of de-emphasize the importance of someone like Bayard Rustin in the civil rights movement, right? Uh, even though, uh, or they tend to overemphasize, right, just his blackness and exclude his queerness, right? Uh, Johnson does a lot of work in regards to that, as does Cohen. Uh, the second one is cultural invisibility. Cultural invisibility is the failure of cultural representation to capture distinctive experiences of intersectional and subordinate groups, right? Uh, so, for example, when we think of uh, I think this is probably a really good one. When we think of like coming out narratives, right, in the mainstream media, we tend to think of kind of this overemphasis on like this kind of sappy coming out story that tends to create a monolithic understanding of what those should be, right? Uh, cultural, Purdy Bond says that that creates a form of cultural invisibility that assumes that everybody has the same story, right? And that they don't because everybody comes from different experiences. The other one is political invisibility. And political invisibility uh, is the uh, particular exclusion by advocacy groups, right? So it provides less attention to those who have intersecting identities. So feminist movements were oftentimes criticized, right? Because they started from the experiences of uh, fairly wealthy white women and tended to exclude the experiences of women of color. And then there's legal invisibility, right? Which is the privilege of pe the privileged people with single disadvantaged identity and it's unclear if people with more than one disadvantaged identity can claim what is called compound discrimination, which is where courts provide same protection, right? So things like domestic violence uh, tends to be a perfect example of kind of that compound discrimination, uh, the way in which we create constructions of criminals, for example, uh, where black men might be more actually uh, targeted uh, via uh, domestic violence policies or legal policies or protections that are in place, right? Um, as, as an example. So I'm going to turn it. So this is kind of the historical trajectory of kind of how identity politics and both uh, that and intersectionality tends to play out um, in the field. One of the things that I really like about this method of looking at these four things is that because one of the major criticisms is that, well, you can't always do an intersectional analysis, right? right? That it's not possible to include every form of intersection. This method suggests that if we understand intersectionality based on these four 
dynamics, right? If we understand the way in which historical, cultural, political, and legal invisibility kind of coexist with one another, we understand the way in which laws and policies function and the way in which society becomes structured to exclude particular populations, right? So, I say all that to ask the question, why should we include it in debate? violence 
and the way in which a lot of the time, most uh, uh, high amount of deaths that women experience are a direct result of gun violence and instances of domestic abuse. So when you fuse that identity, when you look at that and you think, oh, how will this affect me? Oh, that can be my sister, that can be my mother, that can be anybody. That's a way in which you infuse your identity and make the argument not only about these women who would probably be oppressed, but the argument can also be about the way in which it can affect you and it becomes a way in which you can like use your own identity to weigh the argument in the round. In the context of race arguments, and that's something I can speak more to because that's what I do within the round, I would like to use my identity as a black woman in order to persuade um, my judges. So for example, on the living wage topic, I talked about domestic workers and how most of them happen to be women of color, particularly African American women, and how there is no regulation over what they were doing. They don't get any, uh, they don't get uh, days off, they can't unionize, they, oftentimes they're kept away from their children. When I think of that, when I looked at the resolution, it was like, oh, well, I know my aunt is a domestic worker and she complains about this all the time. Oh, I know some of my friend's mothers who can never be home because they're so busy working for uh, X person or Y person. I use my personal identity within the argument to not only say that, oh, this is an important issue, but this is something that can affect someone you know or even yourself. And that's an important distinction to be made is that a lot of times people make assumptions when they hear these kind of identity politics based claims in debate rounds, right? That the argument is that you should vote for me because I'm a black woman, or uh, you should vote for me, right, because I told this narrative, or because I told this story. That's never the argument, right? The it's argument- time gives the argument. That's a bad model you shouldn't end with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's out there. That's not what we're talking That is an argument that is made. Uh, but, um, but it's not the argument, right, itself, right? These claims say, that our worldview is sit like our worldview is situated by our lived reality, right? So we wake up every morning, right? What we put on, what we wear, the things we do, they're all decisions that are shaped by who we are, right? Or that shape who we are. And so uh, this argument, for example, that Sunny is talking about, right, she would read, is one that suggests that it's not that this is why you vote for me but rather that this is how we see the resolution, right? These are the interconnectedness of my experience, right, that puts a face to the actual literature that says this is what happened, right, to the statistics that say this is what happened, right? So it helps to explain the worldview by which we are situated in. And like going off of that point, remember we were talking about how identity politics are meant to confront the norm, right? So the way in which that argument functions is the norm is, oh yeah, living wage ordinances are supposed to help everyone. But when you speci specifically focus on a certain body of individuals or insert identity in that uh, in that regard, it's challenging, hey, it's not just about giving living wage to everyone, but look at this group of individuals who are not only oppressed because of their class, but oppressed because of their sex as well as their race. Look at these individuals who need to be talked about, these individuals who need to be included in the discussion because the way that norms are set up are set up in a way in which they are never talked about to begin with. And that's why it's important to insert that identity within the space. This notion of confronting norms is really important in the way that these arguments get deployed in debate because not only does the explicit injection of identity into rounds mean that we see a shift in the content of the debate round, it also means that we're starting to see a shift in the structure of the debate round, right? So we don't want to go too far into role foul stuff because there's whole other electives for that and we don't have a lot of time. But it's important to keep in mind that some of the most effective ways to leverage identity politics arguments are to challenge the way the debate is traditionally understood to function, right? There's an understanding that we should only vote for whoever is the most technical debater, whoever wins the flow, right? And identity politics arguments, at least as they've been deployed over the last couple of years, are a direct affront to that. And they say, no, maybe there are things that are more important than just flows. Maybe our identity as three people in this debate round has a, like an impact in terms of what policies we're discussing and what policies signing the ballot is a direct endorsement. Right? So the shift to an increased amount of role of the ballot and role of the judge arguments is another way that these uh, literature bases and that these debaters uh, are directly confronting the way the debate is normally understood to function, and it's leading to like positive change on the circuit. Yeah. Uh, another way in which you can see both of these things manifested within rounds is, for example, uh, as Vincent was talking about, intersectionality usually can be used as a response to uh, static notions of identity politics. So, for example, sometimes in debates, uh, for example, let's look at Wilderson, right? If someone runs a Wilderson app and they're talking about the way in which we have to focus on uh, race as the root cause of these different types of oppression, someone can get up and read an intersectional approach, i.e., black feminism, or they can go for black, uh, they can go for queer arguments or queer theory arguments.
talking about the way in which you only focus on race is extremely problematic because it erases different intersections of identity. So it also goes into uh, what Vincent was talking about in terms of single subordinate identity and believing that you're not being, uh, you're not, a, uh, you don't have the ability to oppress other individuals even if you are oppressed. So for example, just because you are a woman does not mean that you can't also participate in patriarchy. Just because you are African American doesn't necessarily mean that you won't have a negative stereotype of what it means to be African American. And this also shows the way in which you can use intersectionality to point out those differences as well as challenge norms that are set up even within oppressed communities themselves. It also means that in regards to that, to the distinction between single and multiple subordinates, uh, it also means that just because you are a woman does not mean you don't have a class, does not mean you don't have a race, does not mean you don't have a sexuality, right? Uh, and those things, right, the belief that because I am this, right, I am not, right, then we're all the same, right, that all of us that share some form of oppression are all the same, right? The argument is no, because there are hierarchies of oppression, right, in the status quo. There are ways in which we tend to think about hierarchies of oppression, right? So just because I might be gay, for example, does not mean that I don't get benefits from my race, right? Does not mean I don't get benefits from being white. Does not mean I don't get benefits from even being male. And so those things, that totalization of identity that tends to happen, right? Intersectionality says we must challenge that belief. I also think it's important really quickly to jump back to these identity categories that we talked about and realize that any of them can stand as like valid literature bases on their own, but there's two distinctions in particular that we didn't explicitly mention. First is the distinction between gender and sex, which is an important one to be made in terms of like cisgendered individuals and transgendered individuals, because the privilege that you can gain from your sex does not necessarily correlate to the privilege that you can gain from your gender. That's just something that you should keep in mind. The two are not like monolithic and always combined. The second one is the distinction between race and skin color, because the value or like the privilege that you can get from your skin color is completely removed from that of your race, right? Like, I have a very white skin tone, which means that I can pass as a white male, but that ignores a lot of the Mexican and like native Mexican heritage that I have, right? So there's a lot that I get to avoid in terms of my skin color. Uh, and that's a distinction that's important in terms of like discussing passing privilege. Uh, and it's just something that we didn't touch on earlier. So I wanna make sure that's clear. Skin color and race are two separate things that give you access to different sorts of privilege and different levels uh, of society. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, how exactly did you word the, like, Gender? So I can get it done, yeah. yeah, just really quickly. Sex is a physical thing, so there's a male body and a female body. Gender is literally the psychological component. So it's whether you identify as a man or as a woman. And then there's everything in between, right? It's not a binary system. There's male, female, intersex, which refers to a whole variety of things. Gender is based on the distinction between performance as a masculinity and femininity versus yeah. sex being the biological distinction between maleness and femaleness. Yeah. And also going off of what important what? distinction, masculinity yeah. and femininity. Yeah, well, going, um, going off of what Rodrigo was talking about, that's also something you want to keep in mind within debate rounds, as in don't generalize or totalize but in regards to your opponent. So, for example, even if your opponent may be you know, typically white, or for example, just because your opponent may look like a male or may look like a female, that does not mean that they are linking into, like, say, a certain criticism that you're reading. So you can't necessarily say, oh, well, you don't necessarily know what this feels like because you look like X. Rather, you need to take the time to recognize that since uh, identity is something that's always political and always being negotiated, the same can also apply for opponents who you are arguing against, and you have to be aware of that fact. Alright, here's what I want to do. Identity is rough to talk about. It's difficult, right? Agree? Anybody disagree? Raise your hand if you agree. Alright, okay, most part. So I want y'all to break off into, we have, what, two, four, six, one. Okay, yeah, we have like 20. Great, break up into groups of five, four-ish. Oh, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, well, oh, no. <laughs> Count off. Yeah. Count off. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. One. Two. Three. Four. Five.
everybody listen. There are three questions I want you all to ask and talk about. Three questions. 